I like him, not pumping me up, but it's helping people out. So, right, Bob? Does it help me out? Okay. Amen. And um, struggling Christian, and uh, Lisa's getting in on it now. We're about on tape 17. This is tape 18 now already. 17. That's a good thing. And she'll at least get to hear some stuff where we're going, the direction we're going tonight. And it's stuff that uh, I wish I had, boy. I just wish I had it. Amen. Years ago. And I think it would help me out. Okay, are we starting now? All righty. Struggling Christian, amen. I'm going to start off with some jokes my wife read to me. And I'll share them with you. Osama bin Laden went to heaven and was greeted by George Washington, who slapped him and yelled, How dare you try to destroy the nation I helped conceive? Patrick Henry then approached and punched Osama in the nose. After that, James Madison entered and kicked him in the shin. He was followed by an angry Thomas Jefferson who whacked Osama over the head with a cane. The thrashing continued as John Randolph, James Monroe, and 66 other early Americans came in and unleashed their anger on the terrorist leader. Suddenly, as Osama lay writhing in unbearable pain, an angel appeared. This is not what you promised me, Osama said to the angel. Come on, Osama, the angel replied. I told you there would be 72 Virginians waiting for you in heaven. <laughs> now, if you don't know that, they believe, you know, otherwise, you know, on silk sheets. <laughs> I'm still going with this. This is run a roll now. The dying penny pincher, <laughs> the dying penny pincher, told his doctor, lawyer, and pastor, I have $90,000 under my mattress. At my funeral, I wanted each of you to toss an envelope with $30,000 into the grave. And after telling them this, he died. At the funeral, each threw his envelope in the grave. Later, the pastor said, I must confess, I needed $10,000 for my new church, so I only threw in $20,000. The doctor admitted, I needed $20,000 for new equipment at the hospital, so I only had $10,000 in the envelope. Gentlemen, I'm shocked that you would blatantly ignore this man's final wish, said the lawyer. I threw in my personal check for the full amount. Come on, come on, it's on a roll, amen. All right. A cop pulls over this guy and says, Sir, I need you, I need you to breathe into this breathalyzer for me. Guy says, I can't do that, I'm asthmatic, and if I do that, I'll have a really big asthma attack. Okay, then, I'll need you to come down to the station with me, and I'll have to do some blood work just to make sure. Sir, I can't do that either. I'm a hypo, uh, what is that? Hemophiliac. And if I do that, I'll bleed to death. Okay, fine. Then I need, need a urine sample from you. I can't do that either, sir. I'm sorry, but I'm a diabetic, and if I do that, my sugar will get really, really low. Okay, then, why don't you step out of the car and walk this white line for me, the officer says. I can't do that either, officer. He says, why not? Because I'm drunk. Okay, we on a roll yet? Just hang in there. Are you picturing this as I tell these stories? Are you picturing this stuff in your mind? Isn't it interesting? <clears throat> Don't ever pay a, a surprise visit to a child in college. You might be the one getting the surprise. I learned this the hard way when I swung by my son's campus during a business trip. Locating what I thought was his fraternity house, I rang the doorbell. Yeah, a voice called from inside. Does uh, Dalen Hausman live here? Yep, the voice answered. Leave him on the front porch, we'll drag him in later. Truth to that. Hmm. Clearly, I wasn't winning the battle of the bulge on my own, so I decided to join a gym. Before you start working out, we'd like to do a health assessment, exclaimed the gym representative. When you come in, wear loose-fitting clothing. Man, if I had loose-fitting loose clothing, we would not be having this conversation, he tells the guy. I'm not done. You getting a picture yet? Are you picturing this stuff in your brain? Man, what a Wednesday. This is the struggling Christian stuff. This really is. I always wanted to be the last guy on earth just to see if all those women were lying to me. You know, I wouldn't date you if you're the last person on earth. Remember that old expression? Okay. Let's see, how about this? I don't consider myself bald, 
I'm simply taller than my hair. Hey, you know the world is going crazy when the best rapper is a white guy, the best golfer is a black guy, and the tallest guy in the NBA is Chinese. <laughs> and it's Fran uh, Libowitz. I didn't give all the names of these, these people that, that have done this, but anyway. I figure you have the same chance of winning the lottery whether you play or not. And then Groucho Marx says this, outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. <laughs> a man brags to a friend about his new hearing aid. It's the most expensive one I've ever had. It cost me 3,500 bucks. His friend asks, what kind is it? The braggart says, half past four. That was nice. Hey, how about this one? How about this one? You getting it yet? <laughs> you guys, I'm going to make you cheer up yet and preach the hell out of you. No, I'm not kidding. Stevie Wonder meets Tiger Woods and <laughs> mentions that he, too, is a golfer. When I tee off, the blind musician explains, I have a guy call to me from the green. My sharp sense of hearing lets me aim. Tiger's skeptical, but when Stevie suggests that they play around for 100 grand, Tiger rarely accepts, figuring it's the easiest hundred grand he'll ever make. So when do you want to play? Stevie shrugs, pick any night. <laughs> you ever see him clap? They won't see this on tape. <laughs> no. The other day I went to work with both ears bandaged. <laughs> My boss asked what happened. Oh man. I was ironing a shirt when the phone rang, and I accidentally answered the iron instead of the phone. Well, that explains one ear, said my confused boss, but what about the other? Well, the person called back. <laughs> it's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. When you're eight years old, nothing is your business. That's some wisdom, isn't it? If your parents never had children, chances are you won't either. When I was born, I was so surprised I couldn't talk for a year and a half. Never lend your car to anyone to whom you've given birth. It's so simple to be wise. Just think of something stupid to say and then don't say it. You say, preacher, my goodness. Now, for these brief little moments of levity, you all had to use your mind, right? Now, raise your hand who was sinning while you were thinking about that. Anybody thinking about dirty pictures, getting drunk, getting high, partying, rock and roll? I don't see your hands. Anybody, anybody thinking wickedly when I was doing that? You mean to tell me by these little jokes and these little pictures, you formed pictures in your mind and it kept your mind off all the cares of the world, all the problems that you have? Isn't that an amazing thing? This is what a struggling Christian is about. Amen? We can do that with some jokes, but it's amazing how many people don't understand the Christian walk and the spiritual implications of, of spiritual warfare that we have that somehow you think, somehow in your pea brain, you can't control your thoughts in the sense that you have power over them. By doing what? Shifting your thinking. See, if, if God's given us the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us, then shouldn't we start experiencing that a little bit more every day? I think so. And I think most of our problems are we forget about that. And when the bad thoughts come, you know what we do? We accept them as ours, don't we? And we live out the things in our brain, and next thing you know, we have problems. So the struggling Christian thing is to help us out, to help us understand that just because you had problems before you're saved does not mean you don't have problems after you're saved. And God's already told us that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. That heathen out there that farms, that depends on them crops coming up, he could be against God, he could be an atheist, but guess what? His crops come up when he plants it. He does principles that the Word of God tells you to do if you want fruit, and he does it, and it happens. But the same guy gets the, 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 the certain boars, certain worms, certain things to kill his crops, and if you were saved out there praying to God, guess what? Certain things like that happen to you too. But it's how you, how you accept these problems, what you do with them is different. And so for the Christian to understand that he's saved, he's born again, he's going to heaven no matter what, 
His heavenly Father created everything. And for a Christian to understand that everything that happens to him is allowed. God's allowed it or it would not happen to him. When you understand those things, it helps you out. It really does. So, think about this. We're starting this, this deal here. Uh, have you ever been rejected? Things happen to you like a group is going somewhere, but a, but a more exciting person has been chosen over you, and you're left. <laughs> that ever happened to you? <laughs> you may look at the group and say, hmm, they're all better than me, so really they're all, all rejecting me. I would say that your feeler gauge is pretty much stuck on rejection. Remember we talked about the feeler gauge, and that is where your emotions are. You've got them from birth all the way up. Somebody programmed you, and you either had discipline or you were undisciplined, but at any rate, you have certain feelings in your body, and I'm telling you, they're, they're so great in certain areas of your life. And, and, and I'm, I include myself, that's why I started studying this thing. So I would say if you were rejected a whole lot, where would your filler gauge be? You would be feeling everybody rejects you. It's just normal, all right? So you, you, you have an overwhelming tendency to be accepted. People that are rejected would, would just have an overwhelming tendency to be, be accepted. And that's very, very dangerous. You say, why? Well, that's how girls lose their virginity. That's how boys get all drunk up and messed up and do things they shouldn't do. Because they want to be what? Accepted. Why? Because they feel rejected. And it, I'm telling you, it's a dangerous thing. Do you feel inferior? You say, yes. Well, are you? See, are you? According to the worldview, yes. According to reality, no. Reality is what God says it is. Amen? Now, can you get a hold of that? In other words, when I open up this Bible, and, and I look over at Lisa, she's a young Christian, a babe in Christ. That means a baby. Do you understand? If I let a person 90, 90 years old out, Lisa, this is the way this goes. If I let somebody 90 years old out there right now, he was 90 years in the world, but he just got saved, then he is a babe in Christ spiritually. And that's what people have a hard time with. You get somebody already fixing their ways at 70, 80, 90 years old, and boom, all of a sudden they receive the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior. You know what they try to do? Take that 80 and 90 years of experience and try to say it's this away. And, and it's, so it's, it's more difficult for them to live that Christian life. You know why? Because when you come in the Bible, and you say, yeah, but God says this. Hey, God says this. Well, it does, don't it? But you know, back in Odd 3, Forget that. We ain't talking out three. We're talking reality. You know what reality is? The Word of God. See, without this being reality, you're messed up, aren't you? We're all going to hell. <laughs> yeah, ain't that nice? Whether you believe it or not, right? That's not nice. I was going to hell. I asked Jesus to save me. I changed places. I'm no longer going there any longer. How do I know that? I've got verses on it. So when I'm talking about reality, I'm talking about approaching the Word of God. I'm talking about a person that, did you ever hear this one before? Good guys, they, uh, they do what last? They finish last. You know what my Bible says? The last shall be first. See, to the world, you're a failure. To a world, if you believe in God, if you believe in God's word, you are a failure. To the world, if you believe in creationism, you are a failure. Uh, today, if you're poor, you're a failure. If you're this, you're a failure. If you're that, you're a failure. According to the world's view, you see you're a failure if you're a Christian. So the Christian's reality is the word of God. Why would you be a success to the world anyway, if you were a Christian in that sense? It'd be sort of scary if they accepted you all the time. So reality is what God says it is. You're to set your mind resting in Christ, totally accepted and secure in his love for you. Sin will flood your mind with thoughts such as, I'm a weird person. It's no wonder they didn't invite me. I hardly blame them. I seem to have such a talent for ruining things. Oh, if I were only different. You know what this is? This is self-indulgence. You're listening to sin and deeply contemplating it without ignoring it and listening to what God says about you. This is one sort of flesh. Then we have this sort also. What other sort is it? One with a self-pity highway in the brain. What is that? Well, 
These would experience sin thoughts such as this. After all I've done for them, it will be a cold day in blank before I'll do anything for them again. Imagine them inviting so-and-so instead of me. That so-and-so always, always worms their way into everything, and they do nothing. Others always get the breaks, and they don't try half as hard as me. Can you see the difference? There's the self-exalting, self-indulgent, one that's introspecting all the time going in. And if you don't think the devil knows this, you're out of your mind. The devil's been around a long time. The devil's watching man for 6,000 years. He's got our number. He knows how... Read your Bible every day, and you'll find out that the characters in the Bible have gotten got by that devil thought. Abraham, David, they all got messed up. Only takes a little, a little break, a little break there. So I'm trying to help you out to understand that if, you're, if you fit one of these, if I fit one of these, uh, think about it anyway. <laughs> you need to think about these things. And um, sometimes, Lord, I wonder if it's worth the effort to serve you. That's an attitude you get from these things. One blames themselves, others blame others, and some have a combination of both. Some of them are like up and down. You talk about schizo, man. Up and down, up and down. They're either blaming themselves and they go in another mode where they're blaming others. In either case, you must instantly begin. And when I say instantly begin, I mean that. Instantly begin to generate thoughts contrary to these based on truth. While claiming what the scripture states, you are dead to the power of sin. You are relaxing in him right now, not a zillion light years away. He loves me. He accepts me. Hey, go to 1 Corinthians 12. See, we'll get some Bible. I'll, I'll make some comments, but I want you to see it in the Word of God. This is going to help you. I'm, I guarantee this is, this is not, we're not, uh, we're not out here to mess you up. We're here to help you. And no matter how people can sit or be quiet and ignore uh, this study right here is going to hit somebody. Why? Because flesh is flesh. We all come up to that. Oh, oh, wretched man that I am. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and um, let's look at 12 through 18. For as the body is one, and hath many what? Members. And all the members of that one body, being many, are what? One body, so also is who? Christ. For by one spirit are we, not water, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have, have been all made to drink into one spirit. Are you getting a picture so far? Everybody that's saved, all the members in the body, if a Jew's saved, uh, bless God, he's involved, a Gentile's saved, we're all in one body now, we're all part of this one body. Are you getting that? Verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore now the body? No. See, he's drawing you a picture now. If you've got, you know, your foot now, if your foot all of a sudden independently starts saying, hey, I'm not part of the body, you look at the foot and say, you're stupid, you're stuck to my leg, idiot. Right? I mean, you know, come on. See, this, this is why God is so good to us. Do you, do you understand how good he is? He didn't have to... Listen, man, do you, ever, do you ever see Christ talk about ants and stuff and, and draw pictures for us? you ever read the whole Bible? He loves us. He draws us pictures of stuff. And right here, see, it's funny when we think about it, but hey, there's some deep significance to this. Because some people say, well, I'm not worth this and I'm not worth that. I'm just the gluteus maximus. I'm just the behind, the B-U-T-T. -T. What good is that? I mean, what good is that? Without it, how would I look? <laughs> Amen. Got to have it. Got to have it. Got to sit down, that's where you get chastened from, amen? I mean, every part is worth something. So verse 15 again. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, am I not the <laughs> of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? See what I mean? You tell me God ain't got sense of humor. If the whole were hearing... Where were the smelling? <laughs> but now look at verse 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased who? Pleased him. So see, when you start saying, I ain't worth this, I ain't worth that, you're calling God a liar. 
See, this teaching is to eliminate pity parties. It's to get people off a guilt trip. It's to understand that according to God, the reality of the thing is this. I'm saved. I'm in the body of Christ. I am worth as much as anybody else in the body of Christ. Because it pleases God. What pleases God? A whole lot of things please God. You ought to read the Bible what pleases God. Preaching of the gospel pleases God. I know that, bless God. Foolishness of the preaching of the gospel. Why? Foolishness to the world. Somebody spit, stammer, and talk about somebody dead, bare rose again 2,000 years ago and nobody saw them. People coming up and getting saved. That's foolish to people that are lost. But it's the power of God and the salvation that's to the saved. So see, so I want you to get this. So no one in Christ is either superior or inferior. Um, choose with your will. You have to choose with your will to force your mind to have a biblical, productive thought life. Did you get that? You have to force your mind to have a biblical, biblical, productive thought life. That's why somebody says, well, preacher, I wish you'd stop saying, read the Bible every day and get up in the morning and do that. Why would I stop doing that? That is your lifeline, man. It's by the washing and the renewing of the word of God that cleanses you. And if you don't have that every day, what are you going to have in your mind? See, it's the connection. It's the connection. You've got to have spiritual connection. We've already got worldly connection. We're already stuck down here. Gravity is already pulling us down to the stinking earth every day. There's something wrong with our body. There's something wrong with the world. There's something going on wrong. If you are not plugged in spiritually, you got problems. Refuse to accept sin's thoughts fed through the brain to your mind. Force yourself for 5, 10, 20 minutes, whatever time, until the thoughts ease off. Did you ever try that yet? Did you ever experience that yet? I can remember when God first took a lot of drugs and stuff from me. Man, it'd be, they come in waves. I mean, it'd be like heavy, heavy. You know, like all of a sudden I just get like an urge like you wouldn't believe. Somebody says, well, if you were born again, you wouldn't have that. Well, you just, well, however you're born again, I don't know. Me, I got a lot of problems in my body. And when them urges come, but I knew this, that if I waited just a little bit longer, thought about the Lord a little bit, just wait a little bit longer, changed my, my thinking, did something different, all of a sudden that urge would back off. Did you know he don't tempt you more than you're able? But he'll always provide a way of escape. But the problem with us is we don't wait long enough, man. We jump right into it. Hey, people that have been around here, my, 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 uh, uh, my trustees, bless God, they're still here with me, amen. They still, they still love their preacher, amen. They've been here a long time. They've been through a whole lot with preacher. And I know they saw a change in preacher over the years. And I saw a change in preacher over the years. And it's God, man. That's all it is, God. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't fake nothing. And I don't take people in the office and smack them around anymore. I make them sit down and listen to me and talk to them. That's better, isn't it, than smacking them around? Yeah. Say, preacher, you wouldn't do that. I know, I know. I know. Let's get back to this. We get off of me a little bit. But anyway, I know, I, I, I've known. I know Jesus, and I know what he's been doing for me, and I appreciate him. So you have to remember that, that the thought comes in your brain. And I emphasize this over and over again. It is the thought that does not say we will do this, Kemosabe. Will you get a hold of this? Now, this is very important for you to get a hold of it. When did you ever sin and have a thought come in your brain and the thought is, we need to get drunk. We need to think bad. Oh, we need to do this. You know, if the devil played that number on you about the third or fourth time, you'd say, what you mean we? Who, who is in here, man? Whoa! You'd freak out. You go to shrink. Get me some Thorazine or Stelazine or something they got now. They got all sorts of things now. Prozac. and You say, I got to have something, man. Something in there is telling me to do stuff. No, you know how it comes in? It's that personal pronoun, right? I need to get drunk. I need to do wrong. I need to think wrong. I, need to, I do need to do this. And you hear it in your voice. And you say, well, might as well. You accept it. And then what happens? You do the thing you hate. You do. Okay, so we're having fun now. So, if he, and I personify it, get the tapes, he being sin, 
tries to crank it up again. What? Those thoughts. You crank it up again with biblical thoughts. You know, you got to work somewhere, right? When somebody says you're not worthy, you're not worth it, and you're going through that, right? You're going through that, Lisa, with some things. I mean, they treat you like a dog. And all of a sudden you say, wait, I ain't no dog. Well, how'd you come across that? Somebody had to shake you or something had to happen to you and say, I am not, I don't have to tolerate this. I am, I am a human being. Amen? I mean, you get a whole, but that's all flesh. That's still human. It's still human. See, that's a person, that's a person that, that, I don't know how they do it, but I know there's lots of millions of people out there not like me. I'm wasted, so it's hard for me to even think about this. But there are actually some people get on a scale and say, bless God, I'm 50 over, I, I'm losing. And they'll go on a diet, and they'll start running around the stinking block, and they can just do that stuff. I, man, when I think about that, I look at that, and next thing you know, I'm, I'm 100 pounds overweight. I can't even comprehend how they do But they, there's people in the flesh that are disciplined enough to do that. Praise God. I wasted my will for years in a motorcycle club with drugs and everything. See, when you take drugs and you alcohol, and you surrender your body and your mind over to that substance, you know what happens? You become a stinking robot. Your will is gone. So when you get saved later in life, you got all those scars, guess what happens? You got a problem, don't you? Why? Because you're so used to giving your will over to the stinking devil and the flesh and the world. So we say, why do you preach so hard to them little kids? Why do you do that? Are you crazy? I wish adults would wake up. Them little kids, what do you want them to do? Have, have your weakness? No, man. <laughs> you don't, they don't need that aggravation. Amen. Give them good pictures in their brain. <laughs> anyway, getting the gist so listen generating biblical thoughts developing this pattern will make you more victorious over the world the flesh and the devil you will begin to mature experientially i said experientially what does that mean by experience every individual in this room right here has to experience god in their prayer life they have to experience god while they're reading the bible all by themselves this bible's going to pop out to you and you're going to say man i never saw that before i mean they're going to experience this it's a daily walk with god See, when you stop that, you stop experiencing God in your life, how are you going to grow? You're not. You can't be victorious. That's the problem with quit. That's why this is struggling Christian. Struggling means there's, there's a pull. I don't know. Up and down, up and down, up and down. See, God's like this, straight. We're like this. But when we're thinking about him, when we're in him, guess how we are? We're just like he is. We're confident. You'll be, so anyway, you'll begin to mature experientially and uh, into what you already are, and I stress that, what you already are in Christ. Your emotions will begin to settle down into the normal Christian walk. The ultimate outcome will be the godly character that will have raised to the surface from your godly nature and godly behavior. Now you say, what in the world does that mean? That means that what you got inside is eventually going to be on the outside you say what do you mean when you got saved you got born again we're going to this a little bit more we're going to go into this i'm going to spit these pages out bless god you got saved you're a new creature in christ jesus so the person inside is what perfect wants to always do right all right you're in house in this prison wants to do wrong eventually by you exercising your prayer life reading that bible right Defeating them thoughts with the reality of who you really are, eventually the outside will operate like Christ would. Isn't that amazing? And then you say, well, I'll never be perfect. Why do you keep saying that? Because you're always giving yourself an excuse. Well, we're just sinners and we're just, you ever hear that? That's an excuse. excuse. I'm si ain't you sick of yourself saying that to yourself? Well, I'm just a sinner. You know, Christ is inside of you saying, yo, wait a minute, wait a minute, whoa, 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 time out. Who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? I'm just a sinner. Where did, where did that thought come from? If you're just a sinner, you're under condemnation. I thought you were a saint. I thought you were saved and born again, a new creature in Christ Jesus. You say, well, now you're preaching that people don't sin. No, I'm saying don't emphasize that. Whatever you emphasize, you're going to serve. Whatever you emphasize, you will serve. You keep playing that little pity party, well, I did this and I did that. Best thing for you to do is just consider yourself a saint that sins, goes over to the old man, digs up a grave, a corpse, and you want to be like that for a while. 
and just tell God you're stinking sorry and get back on the ball game, amen? Get back with it. Say you're sorry, you're sorry. <laughs> and stir, serve God and quit fooling around. And, and then what Paul says, put things behind you. There's a pattern of this. Watchman Nee, a, a Chinese Christian, said that all knowledge is the outgrowth of obedience. Everything else is just information. In other words, you can believe the truth taught in the Bible, yet they can just remain information to you. If you are to convert this information right here in this Bible into knowledge, you must obey it. You must hold a good funeral and put sin to death, amen? In other words, just knowing that the Bible talks about sin nature and talks about the old man, talks about all stuff is one thing. Obeying what it says is another. See, when you obey it, that's when the wisdom comes. That's when knowledge really is knowledge. Right now, you just got a bunch of information. But to apply that Bible through obedience, that's when it starts working. It, you know, like, it's, it's just like I, I told you before, and people get, get crazy when I talk about the tithe. And you go over to Malachi 3.10, right? Everybody goes to Malachi 3.10, and you can tell the attitude of people on when they read that. You know where they get hung up on? As soon as it says, wherein have you robbed God? It says tithes and offerings, and they stop right there, and they just, they just, they just get mad at you and want to beat you up. I said, why don't you cut out the first half? Why don't you read the second half? Why don't you give yourself a break? Did you ever read the second half? No, because you're so stinking stingy, you've been robbing from God, and you're mad. So what do you do? You stay back in that first part and you go through division. You say, I'm not under the law. I'm not over here, you know. Then the preacher's got to go and show you it's before the law, after the law, during the law. Well, I still ain't believing it because the books you got over there, they, they, they're trying to fight, and then you look at them. They've got no money. They've got no stability. They got nothing. Why? Why should God bless them? They don't need God. Did you know that, that that's for an opportunity for God to open up the windows of heaven and bless you? Did you ever read that and study that? That's for God to bless you. See, that's a walk of faith. When you got saved, did you see God? No. You, were you there 2,000 years ago when you died, when you died on the cross? No. Then how in the world did you get saved? Well, I believe. Believe what? Believe what? Well, what the Bible said. Oh, okay. Are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. Will God bless you? Sure he will. See, if you read the Bible right and don't bring an attitude to it, you may get blessed. Wouldn't it be a bummer if you got blessed? Oh, what a thing, man. People just don't want to get blessed. They look at the negative all the time. Just like I said, I go talk to people all the time, knock on their door, get over there and talk to somebody. Well, preacher, you know, I'm just a sinner and I'm just weak. I said, let's stop right there for a minute, okay? Let's first, first, are you saved? Yeah. And then I'm trying to take them to all the verses that tell them, tell them who they are. Does this say this? Yeah. Does this say this? Yeah. Does this say this? Yeah. And you spend an hour with them. Next thing you know what happens? I says, now, are you getting the picture yet? Preacher, you know I'm just a sinner, and I'm just... I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we got, you, you got some thinking that's messed up here. In other words, you don't want to get above it. You don't want power over it. See, you've been in it so long that it's captured your will. you got no will, man. <laughs> and what I'm trying to do is give you the word of God to get your will back. And it don't come at once. It comes a little bit here, a little bit there. Boy, you should hear testimonies. Just like the internet. Hear the testimonies. The guy said, yeah, I had a problem with that. And well, what happened? Some of them say, well, I shot my computer and threw it out. Oh, did that help you? No, he's down at the library doing it. They're doing it somewhere. See, he didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't handle the problem, right? It's the same thing with the TV or anything, right? Amen? If somebody's got that, you're going to bust them at night. You, the women will bust the guys at night, or they'll, they'll bust them somehow. God will, God will open up. God will get them busted. Sure, he will. Guaranteed. So how are you going to have, how are you going to do the problem? You're going to shoot every TV? See, God has, what he has done to us now in this country, he has got that Christian surrounded by sensuality, drunkenness, whoremongering, and fornicating in this country. I mean, you're right in the middle. I don't care if you got rid of every dirty magazine. As soon as you went in a beer and wine store, boom, you'd see something. As soon as you went to stupid Myers, you'd see something. I mean, they got magazines. So what are you going to do? Commit suicide? That's the only way out that I can see. 
So what do you do? You got to start saying to yourself, am I saved? Yes. Is there power in me? Yes. So what do you do? God, help me. And by experiencing his help, you'll start to understand some things about who you serve. He knows where you are. He knows the situation we're all in. Don't you think he knows we need help? Sure. Man, we're, we're really, we can really serve and really get some reward here, people. I'm telling you, judgment seat of Christ, you can really rack it up, man. I mean, I mean, the battles that we face in this country, could you imagine if you had control? If you had a spiritual control of yourself and your will started getting stronger and stronger, you could actually say no. You could actually look at something and then just, you know, just, and not yield. Ain't that, ain't that how that happens? It's, it's the will. The will's weak. So what this, this, this study is about is to show you that your emotions and your thoughts should not control you. The real you ought to control you. And if you're saved, the real you, man, is a new creature. So that's what this study is about, is to help us. By setting our mind properly, our character will take on the properties of Christ. The fruits of the Spirit will begin to emerge from you as a natural product of your obedience. Remember the illustration we used about fruit? You don't see the branches on a grapevine strain and groaning to produce grapes. They simply abide, and the life of the vine produces the fruit. That is what we see happening to us when we appropriate our true identity in Christ. Praise God. What do you mean? You start thinking about him, your character will start changing, won't it? Hey, didn't I, didn't I just tell you some jokes? I mean, some were corny, but you did laugh. I didn't see any of you. I don't, I don't believe any of you were thinking anything bad. I don't think any of you had a sensual thought or an urge to drink or smoke or anything. You were laughing. Why? Because your mind was fixed on what? What the preacher was reading off of this thing. So you tell me by reading the word of God, that can't help? Well, preacher, I got to well, read it more. Well, preacher, don't read it more. <laughs> you know, some people need more. That's why when I said one, you know, you get one Psalms, one Proverbs, that's good for wisdom, and that's good for comfort. But man, get to reading that Bible through. And if you've got a more wicked mind, you better read more. It's something about the Word of God. That's why I'm a Bible believer. I believe that book does something. Romans 7, 22. Now, these are familiar verses we've been covering. And, um, and when I first saw these verses, it was like a blessing to me. I mean, I mean, really. Because I kept thinking I was a schizo. When I was growing in the Lord, I kept thinking, man, how in the world can I be saved and keep doing things wrong? And then some preacher just preached on it one time, you know, and it was like, it, wasn't, it was a tongue twister to some people to say it real quick. But then I says, wow, that's what I'm thinking. How can that be? And then he explained, and I says, Whoa, light bulb went on. That's why I'm doing Okay. See, then it starts. You start growing in the Lord. You start saying, oh, man, there is a battle going on. Okay, you got Romans chapter 7. We're going to cover a few laws here. Romans 7, verse 22. Look what it says. For I delight in the law of God after the what? The inward man. Well, guess what? Just by looking at you, you know what the contrary to that is? If I got an inward, there must be an outward, right? So what this, what this verse is saying, for I delight in the law of God, and everybody knows the law of God is the commandments. So I delight in the in man for them. That's what it says. So, so the law of God, one that is saved desires to live by that law because he knows it pleases God and is right. He doesn't worry about condemnation. He doesn't worry about uh, going to hell. There's the divine nature inside of you. It, it pleases in doing them, them commandments. It, it, it's no hassle to them. You don't have to twist its arm. It just enjoys it. So that's the law of God, right? Okay, now look at the law of my mind. Verse 23. It says, now we're going we're to cover this. There's, there's three laws uh, right there. But I see another law in my members. Remember we were talking about members? What, what is members? That's the parts of your body. And it's warring against the law of what? 
Okay, now, 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 if you go back up to 22, it says, but I, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind. So the law of the mind must be associated with the law of the inner man. Do you understand that? And that means it's perfect and it's pure and it's holy. We're not talking about your muscle of your brain. We're talking about the mind, man. And bringing me into, now watch it, into captivity to the law of what? Sin, which is in my what? Members. So you got the law of God, one that is saved desires to live by that law because he knows it pleases God and is right. Then you got the law of my mind, uh, is how my new nature operates. It wants to do right, it wants to please God and keep the law. But now listen to verse 23 of chapter 7 that we just did. There's another law, the law of sin in my members. There is the overwhelming desire of the flesh to do what? Sin. So we have a continual battle of two laws. The new nature needs the help of the Holy Spirit and the words of God. Verse 24, look what verse 24 says. It says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from, you see this, the body of this death, the body, the outside, not the inside, not the inner man, the body, the outside. So who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Hey, Christian, part of you is praising God, rejoicing in God, and would do anything for God that he asks. But right there, chained to you, is a corpse. This makes you cry out, God, please forgive me for that. I'm sorry I did that. Oh, God, get me out of this mess. See, it's, it's not that you're not free inside. It's you're close enough to it to ruin your day, amen? It's that body. Now, let's look at another law, shall we? Go to Romans chapter 8. You're right there. Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. Look what it says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me what? Free from the law of sin and what? See that? I like it. And we'll not try to get hung up on the other verses yet, amen, because there's a lot of good verses in eight. Give yourself a break and don't wander ahead. You know, if you hear one of those that wander ahead, you know how our pride is, amen? Our pride is terrible, I'm telling you. We want everyone to know, <laughs> we want everyone to know we know as much as preacher and more, amen? Blah, blah, blah. Remember, pride is a spiritual life's suicide. Pride is a spiritual life's suicide. Back to Romans 8, 2. The law of the Spirit. This is an automatic spiritual law. It takes place when a person receives Christ as Savior. It has three operative parts. You got the new birth, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's not water, and you have spiritual circumcision. The Holy Spirit enters, enters the new believer and resurrects the dead spirit. He brings new life to a new man. He places that new believer spiritually into Jesus Christ. The new believer is now one with his Savior. He is one, he is one with his Savior's death, and one with his Savior's resurrection. Finally, he cuts the new man loose from the flesh, and that's the body of sin. So what does all that do? Well, it makes you free from the law of sin and death. You are no longer dead in trespasses and sins. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. This is considered meat in the Word of God, okay? So sometimes you can't get it, but you need milk. But you, sometimes God will allow you to get this too, though. So it's up to God's Holy Spirit and what you need. There's a lot of things that go on. But if you can just understand this, 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 this battle that you have, it'll be a blessing. Look what it says in verse 1. And you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were. Do you see that? Were, that's past tense. Dead in what? Do you see that? Dead in trespasses and sins. So you are no longer dead in trespasses and sins. Why? Because he quickened you. He made you alive. You're no longer dead in trespasses and sins. You are alive in Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life. Go to Romans 6, 4. 
the problem with these good verses, you want to read the whole chapter, but I can't. I'm trying to get something across to you right now. Romans chapter 6. Look what it says. Romans chapter 6, look at verse 4. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, look at that word, what does it say? Should walk in newness of life. Why, don't, why do you like your King James Bible? Because I like the word should. Because that means it's possible, I may not. I'm saved, but I may not. Why? Because I haven't grown to, to know what I'm supposed to do yet. Or I'm rebellion and I'm disobedient. But my Bible says I should walk in newness of life. I should do it. The obvious physical position you find yourself in. Now, I think I give you that Schofield book. When you read that and you get all that down, well, Lisa's going to get real smart. If she ever gets that book down, Standing in State, it'll help you out. What that means is your state is where? In Christ Jesus, right? Right? My standing is in Christ Jesus. I am standing in Christ Jesus. My state changes. Why? Because I'm stuck. It's obvious in this physical prison. I mean, I'm happy today. We were having a good service. I'm, this, this stuff's all clicking. I can go in there and get a phone call, and my state can change. I can pull out here and some nut try to run me over. My state can change. How? Like that. See, but it's up to the Christian to realize his standing before he does something wrong. That's the key. So your standing never changes. I already told you. you, you you're not dead in trespasses and sin anymore. You're in Christ. But this down here changes, man. <laughs> So the law of sin and death goes right on operating in the what? In the flesh. How do you know that? We're right here in Romans. You're back over there in chapter 7. Look at verse 23. It says, but I see another law in my members. Do you see that? Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of what? Sin, which is in my members. Now, the only way to eliminate that is not to have these kinds of members anymore. Sorry. And then look at 25. It don't stop at salvation, I'm telling you. It says, I thank God. Now watch it. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, remember that law of the mind? I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of what? You tell me you ain't got a battle going on and you're saved? You better get saved. If you're saved, you got a battle going on. Nevertheless, you are free from the spiritual consequences of sin and the penalty of the law of God. When Christ justified you, it was paid in full. Paid in full. Past, present, and future. Everything was future to him. Isn't that good, Mr. Maddox? Remember when you got a hold of security of a believer, bless your little heart going around thinking you had to get it and lose it and get it and lose it back and forth up and down like a roller coaster, man? Bless God to finally know you're saved once for all forever. Hallelujah. That's like getting saved again is such a blessing. See, one day you'll be free from the physical prison. When the rapture takes place, you will have a sinless, glorified body. Go to 1 John 3, 2. 1 John, all the way in the back over there, somewhere around Revelation. 1 John 3, 2. See, sometimes when you're teaching like this, sometimes you can get numb just listening because there's so much information. But I, bless God, I hope the Holy Ghost brings it up to you, though, when you need it. You, you over here, 1 John? 
Amen. First John's good, isn't it? Three, two. Look what it says. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Remember, when you, see, whenever you do a cross-reference with a, with a book uh, that has other verses in it that sometimes don't mix what Paul says, you, you stick with what Paul says, amen. And are you a son of God here? Does it say something about you being a son of God? Does it say something about he gave you power to become the sons of God, even them believe in his name? Do you believe that? I hope you do. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now watch it. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That is good. Man, to think about in this battle that I'm going through with the stinking flesh and to, to understand that when I see him, I'm going to be like him. Hallelujah. One day, no more stinking dead man bones and dead man skin and dead man thinking. And by thinking that way, look at the next verse, if I think like that. Verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him does what? Purifieth himself even as he is pure. In other words, if you're thinking about that, you ain't going to let that battle get you, man. You're going to go to God. You're going to understand about your standing in Christ. You're going to go to them verses. You're going to tell them thoughts. Man, go take a hike. I'm ignoring you. I ain't thinking about that no more. That's wrong to think about that. See, right? I think so. You need to do. Go to Philippians chapter 3, back by Colossians, which is over somewhere near Ephesians and stuff. Just, just keep heading to the left in your Bible, if you've got a King James Bible. <laughs> I think it's Philippians, Colossians. You have Philippians chapter 3? <clears throat> you have Philippians chapter 3. Okay, now, now see, whenever I do a study like this and I'm teaching you something, and now you saw 1 John 3, 2, you know what normally I would do right next to 1 John 3, 2? I'd put Philippians 3, 20 and 21. You know why? Because I would know that they're connected somehow. But anyway... You got Philippians 3, look at verse 20 and 21. For our conversation is in where? From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, hallelujah, look at verse 21. Who shall change our what? See, that vile body means no matter how much you work out, no matter how much you look in the mirrors and you think you're cool, you got a vile, stinking body. See, when you work out and you get healthy, you know what you're doing? You're telling God, this is what you should be telling God, I want to be healthy so I can serve you longer. But if you're looking in your mirror saying, mm, the guys are going to check me out, or mm, the babes are going to love me now because look at my biceps, my triceps, look at, look at the six-pack, look at the 12-pack, look at the booty. Man, don't have a good booty. Look, at you must be working out with that booty. You ever hear them people? That is just nuts, man. They're, it's vile. Worms are going to eat this stinking thing. It's vile. I think it's good. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body now what do you think that means it means what it says my body is going to be changed like his glorious body that's what it says according to the working whereby he is able even to do all things unto himself who's going to do it he's going to do it it's it's guaranteed so these are the thoughts that you think about this is not what happens to those unsaved though they receive a new body also and it's not it's, it's, it's not going to live forever. You know what it does? It dies forever. Go to Revelation chapter 20. So he says, well, I should have a testimony. Why should I live for Christ? Why should I do this? Because people are going to die forever in hell. That's why. You've got to grow up in the Lord, get maturity, and say, you know what? I've got to stop acting like this because that, that's not the way a Christian acts. That's not the way he thinks. That's the way he talks. Why? People are dying and going to hell. And they're watching me, and I'm telling them it's, I'm saved. I'm telling them I'm going to heaven. Go to Revelation chapter 20 here, and look at uh, verse uh, 13 and 14. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in like a fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is a fact. That is in your Bible. That is what's going on. Uh, chapter 21 and verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
See, we, when we're born again, you're born twice, you die once. When you were born one time, you died twice. That's why these Pentecostals have to get these verses say, see, see, if you did this and this, then you're going to hell. No, man, not me. Guess what? That's that old guy. Guess what, guess what happened to that old guy? He died 2,000 years ago when Christ died. <laughs> Ain't that amazing? He's in a grave. All his sins were paid for by Jesus Christ. I don't know who you're talking about. So even though the law of sin and death still works in your flesh after you are saved, it is only a temporary thing. Your body will be delivered, amen, eventually. These studies are to get us focused on, number one, Jesus Christ and his plan for us down here. Jesus Christ and his plan for us down here. Number two, the wiles, that's the methods of the devil, to neutralize us into non combatant, Bible-believing Christians. Do you understand that? We're to be active, not passive in the world. Light has conflict with darkness. People are going to die forever in torment. People need the truth. People need to see truth in action. Jesus is truth. Jesus lives through us. Therefore, time wasted in thinking like the old man means... I'm telling you, think about this. Time wasted in thinking like the old man means time wasted doing what Jesus wants us to do. Therefore, we're full of self. That means selfish, not selfless, full of him. And that's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. Now, in closing, go to Luke chapter 16. See, some people still think it's a game. It's not a game. <laughs> we're in battle, man. You can have fun. God will let you have fun, but I mean, it's... The ultimate thing is when Jason's messing with these teenagers, guess what? There's a spiritual conflict that they're going through. There's hormones raging. Uh, there's the fornication. There's the, the spirit of the world seducing doctors and devils. He's got to watch himself. He's got he's to pray for these teenagers, right? I mean, there's a burden that's got to be there. You have fun, but in, in one eye, you're watching them. You're concerned about them. You, you can understand. You can watch their continents. You can watch what they're doing. You watch their, and you pray harder, and you teach harder. Why? Because you want them to get a hold of some spiritual principles that, so they won't get scars. Go to Luke chapter 16. You got that? Okay, start reading in verse 19. Hey, this is a true story, okay? This is a true story, not a parable. Luke chapter 16. Look at verse 19 on. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gates full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, do you see that? This is not a parable. It's not something Jehovah's Witness can get you with. This is what it says is what happened. And in hell, he lift up his eyes. What does that mean? It means he's got eyes in hell. Being in torments, that means he feels it and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. He has perception. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, he's got recognition, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame, singular, personal flame, personal torment. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. And guess what? It's not purgatory. There's no way. If there was somebody in purgatory, you could have said, Hey, man, Abraham, uh, give that guy a cup of water. He can run it through purgatory and hand it to him. That's a bunch of garbage. That's the way out to sin. That's all. That's where the Catholic Church gets their stinking money. Anyway. Anyway. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us. That would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. You see that? Now he's got a burden for his lost family. But he's in hell burden. He don't want him to come there. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, now watch it, they have Moses and the prophets. You know what he's telling you? Back when this was going on, Moses and the prophets were dead. He said, they got the scripture just like you got the scripture, bud. And you didn't listen to the scripture. You didn't believe the scripture. Neither would they. Look at it. Even if somebody came from the dead. 
He said, Abraham hath honored them. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. How about that? Because they sure weren't persuaded about the Lord Jesus Christ, are they? Are they? One rose from the dead, Jesus Christ. So you see, there's a lot to do with this struggling Christian. There's a lot that, that takes place in our lives. And we've got to understand that the devil wants to neutralize us. us. He wants to get us to the place where we're going to continue to sin. Pretty soon we're going to get to the place where our mind is going to think that we're just so backslidden that we can't be helped. Next thing you know, our will is going to be so little, we, can't, we ain't even going to have a will to serve God. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to wake up one day in front of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to run that on him. Because he says, I give you the word of God. I give you the spirit of God. My goodness. Heed. Obey. Experientially. Grow. Put away. Separate. Stuff that would mess you up. Amen? And God will give you rest for your souls. That's a blessing to me. I mean, this helped me out. This study has helped me out. I'm glad you people encouraged me to do this. You say, why? Because I want to stay in the game. I don't, I don't, I don't want to drop the ball. I don't want my family to all of a sudden to lose my testimony and have my kids say, well, there's dad. You know, well, he did preach on that dual nature, and he did, man, man. That's scary. I mean, we're in a battle, folks. That devil hates your guts. And let, me, let me reiterate and tell you this. The devil sees who you are spiritually. Do you understand that? Even if you don't see yourself. He already sees you. He already sees me, St. Robert. He sees me in Christ already. He's in the spirit realm, man. He already knows I'm, the, I'm, I'm a good guy, right? He already knows that you're, you're good people in Christ. He knows who to stop. And all he's got to do is keep elevating that old person on the outside. And you'll keep listening, and you'll keep giving in, and you'll keep getting chastened by the Lord. You'll keep getting whooped. You won't have no blessings. You won't have no peace. You'll be pretty soon you won't be able to sleep at night. And it'll be just as if you weren't saved. Ain't that a bummer? Until God gets you back, looking up. The only way you can look up, I hate to say it. See, you either fall prostrate repentance to God and say, God, I need help. Or the next step is you're like this, on your back, looking up for help. I'd rather go on my front like this, boom. Because he knows how to put you on your back. Amen? If you're saved here, praise God. Get these scriptures, a lot of information. But get down and think about it and meditate on it. Just like them jokes made you laugh, think about that. Amen? Okay, that's it.